as I shared last week, while we are moving more rapidly now in our fifth time through the Bible, as we've come to the book of Romans, we're slowing down. And the reason why is because of the important role the book of Romans plays in forming our theology and understanding of the gospel. Though we're picking it up where we left off last week at verse uh, 24, we need to go back and start this section, uh, which starts verse at, really at verse 28. Excuse me, we're starting at verse 22. Uh, verse 18, excuse me, is where this section starts. So we need to begin reading there <clears throat> to catch Paul's overall thought. He says in verse 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, because God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now, we went into depth on that last week. Let me just summarize tonight. Paul says that the existence of creation, the physical universe, logically demands the existence of an eternal and all-powerful creator. To deny that is to commit intellectual suicide that spills over into a futility that ultimately leads to idolatry. It isn't a question of whether or not someone believes in God. The only question is what or who they put in God's place. And so verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, that is these that are suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, professing themselves to be wise, claiming to be wise, they become fools. And they change the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. I never cease to marvel at the arrogance of some unbelievers who claim that a lack of faith makes them both morally and intellectually superior to those who believe in God. They esteem themselves wise, as Paul says here, but they are in fact fools. Atheist luminary Richard Dawkins blames religion for virtually all the woes and tragedies of history. He says that it's those that have thrown off religion who've brought the most benefit to humanity. Really? So, Richard, what are we to do with Karl Marx, Vladimir Lenin, Stalin, Mao Zedong, Adolf Hitler? These men threw off the knowledge of God. What great benefits they have brought to history. Apparently, Dawkins is unaware of the people who started public education literacy campaigns, the abolition of slavery, orphanages, hospitals, and nearly every university in both Europe and the Americas. All of them were started by committed believers in Jesus Christ. Now, being the learned man that he is, surely he knows that it was people of faith who are major contributors to relief efforts around the world and who staff organizations that are first on the scene when there is some kind of global catastrophe. Let me tell you, it is certainly not Richard Dawkins and his atheist friends that are funding and staffing, you know, Red Cross and Samaritan's Purse and all these organizations that go out and help needy people. They sit comfortably in their homes and write books about how stupid it is to believe in God. It's Christians compelled by the love of Christ that are helping the poor and the needy. Those who deny God think that they're smart because of their unbelief. In fact, they're fools because their rejection they reject the basis of all wisdom, which is the knowledge and the fear of God. Remember what the book of Proverbs says? The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. Having done so, having rejected the fear of God, the knowledge of God, they begin a long, slow slide into spiritual darkness. A slide that we are seeing lived out in our own day. In chart 20, uh, verse, excuse me, verse 23 here charts that slide. Man was created to worship God. When he rejects God, the urge to worship turns to the next thing, that which is created in God's image, which is man. So you reject God, and what you'll do is you'll put human beings in his place. Secular humanism is just the enthronement 
of man in the place of God. But man without God senses something vital is missing from his life, and so he seeks for inspiration in traits and things that he wishes he had. And, and so, man, I want to fly, and so he begins to worship birds. He lacks power. He senses he's lost his, his power that's intrinsic to having been created in the image of God because that image is now marred and fallen. He longs for that power, and so he begins to worship the lion, the tiger, and the bear. Oh, my. <laughs> but finding no satisfaction in these idols, he falls to the place of worshiping reptiles and bugs and the dung beetle of the Egyptians. The, the, yes, the Egyptians worship the dung beetle. You know where the dung beetle lives? I'll give you one clue. It's called a dung beetle for a reason. It lives in poop. The Egyptians worshipped it. You know, archaeologists and anthropologists have found in every corner of the world evidence of man's insatiable appetite to worship. Modern man is no less wired for worship than the ancients. The environmental movement, what is known as deep ecology, is just one of secularism, secular humanism's many religions. It deifies nature and places more value in birds, beasts, and bugs than in human beings. Man will worship. The only question is what he will worship. Verse 24, therefore, that is because people reject God and set up idols in his place, God also gave them up. Paul is going to use that phrase, God gave them up, now three times in the passage that we're looking at tonight. First, here in verse 24, God gives people up to a depraved sensuality. Second, in verse 26, he gives them up to a depraved sexuality. And third, in verse 28, he gives them up to a depraved mentality. Verse 24, therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So they gave up on the knowledge of God, so God gives them up to what they yearn for. Remember what we saw last week. The problem with rebel man isn't with his head, it's with his heart. It isn't that he can't believe in God, it's that he won't believe in God. He's sinful and he wants what he wants without having feelings of guilt or the fear that judgment is coming. That's why people either reject the existence of God or they will edit his character to take those qualities away from him that can give them the sense that one day they're going to stand before him for judgment. When someone constantly rejects the conviction of the Holy Spirit, they risk coming to the place where God says, okay, you, you don't want me to pursue you in my love? Have it your way. He lets them go to pursue the evil that their hearts long for. And that's what Paul is saying here. He gives them over to pursue their desires. He stops resisting them. Many years ago, my family went on vacation with another family in the church. And uh, we were at a house up by uh, Lake Nascimento. And uh, they had a little two-year-old who was incredibly willful. And she... Uh, want Anything that she could get in her hand ended up in her mouth. So I had to constantly keep an eye on her. And uh, so I, I'm sitting on the couch in the living room one day, and I, I see her, you know, crawling around, and we're chit-chatting, and I kind of lose attention on her. And I, I notice a little bit later, she's over, the sliding glass door is open, the sliding screen is open as well. And I notice that she's very attentive to the track, and she's got her finger, and she's doing this in, in, the, in the track. Do you have a sliding glass door in your house? What's that track get like? It's gross. Now, this was a, a vacation rental house. So there's, there's hair, there's old WD-40, which is a dust magnet and sucks everything with 100 miles to it. There's bugs, there's... So I, I realize she's digging in there and knowing anything that gets in her hand is going in her mouth. I run over there 
And as I'm running over, she sits up and she takes this big gob of black goo and puts it in her mouth, starts to chew. I ran over, I, I grabbed the top of her head and I tried to get her mouth open. And she, and she gave me that look like, nope. I finally, got, I finally got her mouth open and pulled this hairy, gross ball. It had an old cigarette butt in it. And I pulled it out of her mouth. She was furious with me, furious that I was disabusing her of her wad of grotesquerie. You know, I stopped her because she was a toddler and didn't know any better. What if that same young woman grows to be 20 years old and she's still eating out of the door track? You know, it'd be right for us to tell her to stop it, but, but would it really be right for us to go over and pull it out of her mouth? No, if she's determined that she's going to have that, there's really not much that we can do. There comes a point in someone's rebellion against God when he says, you're determined to have your mouth full of grease, hair, bugs, and cigarette butts? Go ahead. Because sin is progressive, once man starts down that path, it gets worse. Just as Paul charts here. Let me ask you a question. Can anything satisfy us, truly satisfy us apart from God? Okay. But people will try to find satisfaction in things apart from God, right? So what happens when they, they try it for a while? Does it satisfy for a while? Yes. Does it, con does it continue to satisfy? No. So what do they do? They have to up the ante. Dr drugs, sex, name it, right? The, the, the guy who drinks a beer and gets a little buzz, in a month, how many beers is he drinking? Three, four. In a year, if he keeps down that path, he's, he's downing a fifth of whiskey. He's going after that buzz. It, you've, you have to keep upping the level of stimulation to get the same level of satisfaction. Because from the beginning, sin wants to trap us. It wants to pull us down. It wants to destroy us. Psalm 8 says that God created humans a little lower than the angels. Angels are spirits without bodies. Genesis 1 presents humans as above the animals, which have a body, but they don't have a spirit. Human beings are unique in that they possess both a body and a spirit. Because of man's unique position in creation, he can either move upward in the realm of the spirit or downward in the realm just of the body. Man's body was meant to be the vessel for his spirit as he communed with God. And his body is best used when it's the vehicle for spiritual life on earth. But when man rejects God, the spirit dies and all that's left is the body and its desires for pleasure. The result of rejecting God is a life dominated by the body's demands. Again, since satisfaction is fleeting, people keep coming up with new ways to pleasure their bodies. The abuse of alcohol and drugs and sex, they're just forms of a depraved sensuality. In more extreme forms, people realize the pursuit of pleasure doesn't really scratch the satisfaction itch, and so they begin to dishonor their bodies as Paul says here, through grotesque practices, bizarre clothing and hairstyles. They disfigure their bodies. Sexual perversion becomes common. Abortion, euthanasia, infanticide, even genocide becomes socially acceptable. While there is abundant evidence in our modern society, they're not new. These things are, are not new. They're signs every great civilization exhibits in its last days. Look at verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. Here's the second thing God gives up, gives people up to that reject him. A depraved sexuality. Vile passions here refers to disgusting desires, shameful longings. Paul refers to that kind of sick thought that when it occurs to you, it surprises even you. You ever had that? 
Like you might be sitting, sometimes that happens in church. And you'll just be sitting there and you're chilling, you're doing just fine. And all of a sudden this thought comes and you're like, what? Where did that come from? That is sick. What just happened? Well, it's the enemy suggesting thoughts. That it could even occur to you means you have the potential to think that thought. And it can surprise you sometimes. Sometimes you'll get this thought and you'll go, oh my goodness, where did that come from? That is, when you think of it, it's so destructive. Okay, so I have to admit, there have been times I've been driving down the freeway. Just driving down the freeway. Always going the speed limit. Lord, forgive me for lying just now. <laughs> and this, this overwhelming urge will come on me to grab the steering wheel at 70 miles an hour and just yank it really hard to the left or right. What would happen if I did that? The car would just, it wouldn't turn. It would just flip over and that would be the end of me. And I have to admit, that thought occasionally, just out of the blue, I'll be, I could be talking to somebody, listening to something on the radio, and just that thought will just come. You tell me, where does that, who's the author of that thought? That's satanic. And I, I'll look, it's like I'm sitting there talking to myself, where did that come from? You sick puppy. It's a thought that's so utterly evil, wicked, nasty. If anyone knew you were thinking it, you would be embarrassed beyond recovery. Yet there are people so spiritually far gone, they are so hardened, so inured to the conviction of the Holy Spirit, even these most evil things have become their delight. They feel no shame in pursuing them publicly. Paul's referring to sexual depravity and gives one of the ways this depravity manifests itself. Now listen, we're going to have to deal with a subject here that Paul sets in front of us, that, is, that we're, really the world would tell us, you can't say that. But it's in our Bible, so we're going to keep saying it. Look at verse 26. Look at the last part of verse 26. For even their women exchange the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one another, men with men, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their heir, which was due. Paul uses polite euphemisms for sexual intimacy when he speaks here of the natural use. This was a discreet term referring to sexual intercourse. It's important we understand what Paul is and isn't saying. He's not saying that some raving hobophobe, he's not, he's not some kind of raving homophobe trying to rally the troops against homosexuality. That's not what Paul is saying here. Living in the permissive culture that he did, let's not forget this was the Greco-Roman culture where homosexuality was accepted Having the privilege of having led thousands of people to faith in Christ, Paul knew that there were people in churches scattered around the empire that had been practicing homosexuals before their conversion to Christ. He knew that. How do we know that? Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Here's what he writes to the Corinthians. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, that's people who have sex outside of marriage, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed. But you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. God created men and women as sexual creatures. Can I get an amen? If we're going to talk about this, let's be bold about it. Who, whose idea is sex? It's God's. He created us male and female. And the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife is part of God's plan. He intends it to be a pleasurable, wonderful, fulfilling experience for a husband and a wife. The proper place for sex is within the boundaries of marriage. 
But when people reject God, life spins out of control, including their sexuality. Paul refers here to people so deep into their rejection of God that he's turned them over to the depravity that they long for. Their view is so distorted, there is a complete reversal of themselves. Since the only true way to know oneself is to know God, rejecting him ultimately results in the complete loss of one's own self-understanding. That's what Paul describes here. A complete reversal of what God intended in our creation as sexual beings. It began in our society with the acceptance of homosexuality, and it has moved now quickly to the whole issue of transgenderism. But Paul's focus here is more on society as a whole than individuals. And we can see that in two ways. First, in Greek, he doesn't use the more personal words for men and women. He uses terms that would, we would better translate it as male and female. And second, look carefully at verse 26. Look, look at verse 26 again. It says, for even their women, their women. He's speaking about a culture. He's speaking about a society. Paul had met many men and women who'd come to Christ from a homosexual lifestyle. Like any good pastor, he'd talked with them. He'd heard their stories. He knew their struggles. He'd provided counsel to those battling with same-sex attraction. But that's really not who he's speaking about in verses 26 and 27. He's pointing, listen, he's pointing to a culture that celebrates homosexuality as normal. That's who he's speaking about. Paul's whole point is that to consider homosexuality normal is a sign that God has given a society over to sexual depravity. Remember what he said? God gave them up. Gave what? Them up. Who? People that have rejected God. But not just individuals. When the individuals now form the basis of the culture. When the culture turns its back on God. God turns that culture over. All one has to do is read a little history to realize that virtually every great civilization began with strong prohibitions against homosexuality. But as wealth, power, and decadence grew, so did the push for its acceptance. A sure sign a civilization is about to go down is when it embraces homosexuality as a norm. Ancient Greece said that homosexual love was the purest and highest form of love just before it fell. Rome had strict rules against homosexuality throughout its years of ascendancy, but the 14 of her last emperors were homosexuals. The same can be said for the ancient Babylonians, Persians, Egyptians, and a host of others. All of this makes our time and culture that much more troubling. In a single generation, we've seen the traditional ban on homosexuality replaced by an enforced acceptance, approval, and now preference for it. The U.S. Supreme Court, as you know, has legalized same-sex marriage. Major corporations are being pressed by pro-gay groups to publicly support their agenda. And if they refuse to do so, they face a boycott. It's now de rigueur for public figures to state what their position on same-sex marriages. And woe to the one who fails to tout the party line. Some years ago, at taxpayer, a taxpayer-funded event called Outfest in Philadelphia, there was a small group of Christians that showed up to lovingly suggest that God could deliver people from the sin of homosexuality. A militant homosexual group surrounded and began harassing them eventually pushing several of them to the ground, tearing up their signs and their literature and threatening them. The police, who were standing by, watched the entire thing, refused to intervene until the militants were done beating on them. Then they arrested the Christians, charging 11 of them with disorderly conduct, including two elderly grandmothers. The list of charges that the Philadelphia DA came up with included three felonies and four misdemeanors. The felonies were criminal conspiracy, riot, and ethnic intimidation, which is a hate crime in Philadelphia. 
Now, the charges were eventually dropped despite the DA's insistence to prosecute. It's just a sign of the times. Look at verse 27 again. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, meaning normal sexual relations, burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is, what? Shameful. And then note this, and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. There are, in fact, a host of physical and emotional problems that homosexuals are prone to because of their lifestyle. This is just a fact. And, and today, me saying this in this kind of a forum is subject now to censure. But it's truth. Homosexuality isn't the only form of sexual depravity. There are many other perversions. The consequences of sexual sin are epidemic today. The American Sexual Health Association reports that half of all sexually active people will contract a sexually transmitted disease in their lifetime. Did you hear me? Half of all sexually active people will contract an STD in their lifetime. At any given time, one-third of the U.S. population has an STD. 110 million people. The CDC reports that there are 20 million new cases of STDs every year. 24,000 women become infertile because of an STD every year. And the annual cost associated with treating STDs is $16 billion. But you know, there's a simple remedy to the plague and epidemic of sexually transmitted diseases. A very simple remedy. And you all know what it is, don't you? Keep sex where God designed it, in marriage. If every man and woman in the United States were to start doing what God said right now, we could wipe out sexually transmitted diseases in one generation. Verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. The third thing that God gives people who reject him up to is depraved mentality. Because thoughts are the seedbed of actions, once the thought life is corrupt, it's inevitable that one's lifestyle will fall apart. We were designed to love, worship, and serve God. When you wrench life off that base, it can only end in futility. So Paul gives a long list of the kinds of things marking the lifestyle of those that give up on God. They are, as if they do those things, he says, which are not fitting. In other words, they don't work. They do stuff that doesn't work. Man, doesn't that just describe our world today? I mean, think about it, especially the whole political scene. They do stuff that isn't fitting. They do stuff that doesn't work. Man. Okay, verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. After that list, they are whisperers. And it's like, okay. Look at it. Full of envy and murder. What, what did we just have happen in our country this last weekend? They are whisperers. What does that mean? Yeah, they're, they're gossips. Oh, did you hear about? You know, backbiters. Such a great phrase. You know, you, the, the stabbers in the back. Backbiters. It's just an interesting picture. Arr. You're biting somebody in the back. The idea is you're talking to them this way, you know, and they turn around, and you're like, ah, oh, how you doing? They turn, ah, sink their teeth in them. Haters of God. Which, think about that phrase, haters of God. You can understand why in our modern world, you know, with its pseudo-intellectualism of scientism, why there might be people that are atheists that deny the existence of God. These are people who hate God. In other words, they admit he's there, 
And instead of doing what they ought, which everything is telling them they should do, which is love and serve him, they hate him. Do you know anybody that hates God? Do you know anybody personally? Do you know a human being that actually hates God? You see, how illogical is that? Tr- certainly, you know, you want to reason with people. Can, can, we, can we talk? Can we reason? Do you believe in God? Yes. How do you feel about it? I hate him. Well, in your thinking, you think maybe there might be something wrong with what you think about God, that you hate him? No. Okay. There's something has happened in their life that the enemy has rushed in on the back of and lied to them about God. Probably lost someone that was dear to them and they, you know, the enemy loves to come in and blame bad things on God. We need to pray, oh Lord, please help them see that what they're believing about you isn't true. If people knew the true, real God, how could they not but love him? Violent proud boasters. That word proud, just that idea of being proud. Sadly, listen to me, that's a sin we make room for in the church. Pride. And it is, in fact, the root of all the rest Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. I I don't need to give illustrations of any of this because we see it every day. Just chart the devolution of the average high school campus. You know the two biggest complaints that teachers had in the 50s, high school teachers? The two biggest problems that they had in school? Chewing gum and running in the halls. Those were the two biggest complaints that teachers had. That students chewed gum and ran in the halls. When I graduated from high school, I graduated in 1973. Yeah, I did. I'm old. The biggest problems on my campus and my, my senior class was about 500 students. Um, the two biggest problems were grass. Some of you know it as pot. <laughs> Mary Jane. Weed. And uh, sex. But in my graduating class, not a single girl was pregnant. What about schools now? There are police on most high school campuses. That's part of their their assignment to be on campus, roving the campuses. There are some schools in Los Angeles that have to have metal detectors in the doorways. And teen pregnancy and, and teen parents <laughs> are so much a part of the system that they actually have special programs for, for teen moms now to bring their kids to school with them. School shootings. Drugs. But let's be honest, the list that Paul rolls out here has been true of every, every generation, hasn't it? There's always been the unrighteous. There's always been sexual immorality. There's always been covetousness. Murder is not new, nor is backbiting and boasting. Disobedient kids are certainly nothing new. Can I get an amen? (laughs) Kids have always been disobedient. Started with Cain. But please understand that Paul is not just identifying general human fallenness. The real clincher is verse 32. Look at what he says in verse 32. Who, those that God has given up to this long list of depravity, who 
knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. Paul is speaking of a society as a whole, an entire culture that's gone so far from God that it calls evil good and good evil. People not only engage in immorality themselves because they're weak, they've given up on virtue altogether and have long gotten past the feeling of guilt. Now they celebrate their sin and they honor those who do with them. They're entertained by evil, by the perverse, profane, debauched, depraved. They make heroes of those that sin boldly and defiantly. They enshrine and honor those that defy God. We actually have an entire month on our calendar now, June, called Pride Month. Where people are encouraged to take pride, may I say it, in their sin. In their perversion. That we live in that time in the midst of that culture requires you do nothing more than turn on the radio or TV. In the early 5th century, a quiet little monk by the name of Telemachus from the eastern reaches of the Roman Empire visited Rome. He heard of the great games in the Colosseum. He decided to find out what all the fuss was about. And so there he was, sitting in the stands of the Colosseum while two gladiators went to town on each other. He rushed from his seat, jumped over the fence and onto the field to stop these men that were trying to kill each other. With Jesus' words, blessed are the peacemaker, ringing in his ears, he tried to separate the fighters. Now, the popular version of the story says that one of the gladiators, angry at the interference, stabbed him and he died. And that the people in the stands, when they saw this, oh! And they one by one left the stands, and that was the end of the gladiatorial combats in Rome. That's not how the story ends. It was indeed the end of the gladiatorial contests, but the spectators were furious at Telemachus' attempt to halt their entertainment and stoned him to death. It wasn't the gladiator that killed him, it was the spectators. His Christian convictions about the sanctity of life were despised by the crowd, that demanded a good show for their coin. They came to see death. What matter if some puny monk was added to that day's victims? It was only when word of Telemachus' death reached the ears of the emperor Honorius that he passed an edict ending the games. A shocking, a revolting. But that's ancient history. You know, that was back when people were backward and they didn't know any better. You know, life was cheap. Certainly, we're more enlightened now. June 23rd of 2007, 27-year-old LaShonda Calloway of Wichita was stabbed in a convenience store. Surveillance video showed five shoppers stepping over her body to finish their shopping. One shopper even stopped to take a picture of her with his cell phone. No one thought to treat her wounds, to comfort her. It was only over two minutes, it was over two minutes after the stabbing, someone finally called 911. The paramedics began treatment only four minutes later, but because of the delay in calling 911, the loss of blood ended up costing Calloway her life. She died at the hospital. And of course, we all know that tale isn't just some isolated event. That kind of thing happens almost every day in some major American city. Now, according to polls, 86% of Americans say they believe in the God of the Bible. Let me say that again. According to recent polls, 86% of Americans say they believe in the God of the Bible. Tell me, on your way here tonight, did you see 8 out of 10 of your neighbors getting in their car to go to church for Bible study? Do four out of five people where you work believe in Christ? They, do they believe in the God of the Bible? Is there a disconnect between what people say they believe and how they live? 
a major. If 86% of adult Americans genuinely believed in God, here's the way we would read verses 24 through 32. Let, let me read it as though <laughs> we had a society where 8 out of 10 people were Christians and lived it. Here we go. Therefore, because they honor God, he bestows on them self-control and purity. Since they consider their bodies temples of the Holy Spirit, they cherish the truth of God and worship and serve him as the creator, blessed forever. For this reason, God rewards them with pure and wholesome lives, lived with carefree ease, even in their most intimate relations, so that they all receive in themselves the reward of their fidelity. Because they acknowledge God in all things, he rewards them with a clear and sound mind. And because their thoughts are sound, they always do the things that ensure that life works. Being filled with righteousness, goodness, generosity, kindness, selflessness, life, health, honesty, and kindness, they're gentle in speech, always building each other up, lovers of God, respectful, humble, selfless, inventors of good and helpful things, obedient to parents, oh please, understanding, <laughs> trustworthy, loving, and merciful. Since they know and do the will of God, they possess an unsurpassed quality of life that refuses to hoard to themselves, but in love and concern for the welfare of others, they give hearty approval and honor to those who likewise live virtuously. Now you tell me, which of those two readings the actual book of Romans or what I just read, which reflects the world we live in more accurately? The first one, right? And while in fact, what Paul writes is a much clearer reflection of our culture, what I just read is what better take place in here. This, that, that better mark us, right? Because if we were to take a poll right now, more than 86% of us would say we believe in the God of the Bible. <laughs> w w folks, listen, we, 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 need to, we need to not be discouraged by this. This is what Paul has defined here is the world. This is the world. This is the world without God. But we have God and he has us. And we need to be demonstrating. We need to be living out that reality. You say you believe in God, live like it. Really live like it. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Paul knew that as the Romans read this, they'd agree vigorously with a review of the wickedness of others just as we've done. And so he turns his pen and points to his readers, including them, <laughs> in his indictment. You may remember that the prophet Nathan had done this with David many years before. Comes to King David. David, I've heard this story about this rich man that stole his poor neighbor's sheep and served it as mutton to a guest. David says, That man shall die! Nathan yeah, I'm talking about you. Because he had just done that with Bathsheba and her husband. And rushing to judgment on another, David judged himself. And that's exactly what Paul says here. When we judge others, we're really judging ourselves. Now listen, I know that vegetables are good for you. <laughs> and you should eat vegetables regularly. You should. Tara, you should, re you should eat more vegetables. I don't like vegetables. But you, you should eat lots of vegetables because they will help you stay healthy longer. And that will mean that you probably don't need to draw on Medicare, and that means my taxes won't go up. So you need to eat your vegetables. Don't expect me to eat any vegetables. I don't like them. But I don't care if you don't like them, you eat them. And here's what's bizarre. I see nothing wrong having both ideas side by side in my head. And the thing is, so do you. Probably not with vegetables, but we hold, we hold these goofy ideas. We have one set of rules for everybody else, but when it comes to me, I have a hall pass. We do, don't we? We do this. 
Consider traffic laws. We want everyone else to obey them. But for us, it's different. When we approach a stop sign, I want you to stop even if I run it. If you run it before I get a chance to, you will hear my wrath. <laughs> Speeding's different. I don't mind if other people are speeding on the freeway because it means there's less likelihood that I'm going to get singled out and pulled over by a cop. If we're all doing 80, cop's not going to pull me over. But when I'm home watching the Dodger game and my, my wife or my kids are out on the freeway, everybody should do 55. <laughs> everybody. That is the essence of hypocrisy. That's hypocrisy right there, folks. You know what a hypocrite is? A hypocrite is someone that complains that there's too much sex and violence on his DVR. <laughs> For those of you that don't get that, <laughs> ask somebody that laughed. <laughs> when we judge others, we're really judging ourselves because we admit that there's a standard by which to judge. And that's a sword that cuts both ways. When we render judgment, we don't just claim the verdict is something that we alone hold. That's the whole point of passing judgment. See, listen, if, I, if, I, if we're in conversation and we're talking about somebody, we go, oh, that is so wrong, that I'm saying that is so wrong, I'm expecting you to agree with me. I'm expecting you to recognize the same standard I do, that there must be some standard outside of us, you see? This is actually an argument that I have used with atheists before. They don't believe in God. So I'll say, well, there's no real objective standard of right and wrong then. And they go, well, no, there really isn't. And I said, so if right now I were to stomp on the, on the, the top of your foot, just grind your, uh, what would you do? Well, I, you can't do that. And I'd say, well, but you just, there's no standard. See, if you, if you, slam your foot down on the, the, the top of the arch of an atheist, they're going to look to everybody around them and say, look what he just did. That was so wrong. They're appealing to a standard they believe everybody should agree on, that certain behavior isn't acceptable, especially if you do it to me. You see? When we judge others, we are in fact saying there must be some standard out there by which I'm appealing to that everybody should agree on. The problem is we don't apply that consistently. We want others to live by it. We will give ourselves a pass when we don't. We tend to judge, judge others' behavior, but want to be judged on our intentions. But Paul makes clear judging others leaves us without excuse regarding our own sin and moral failure. Because we're created in God's image deep within us, it is a profound awareness of right and wrong. Being fallen, God's image is marred and broken. That's why we struggle. But there's enough of the image left to point our moral compass towards truth. Throughout history, societies have given different expressions to this inner moral compass by making different rules, laws, valuing different virtues. So skeptics will often point to these differences as proof there's no ultimate right and wrong or good and evil. People have differed on when it's okay to kill. How many people you can marry and, and be married to at the same time? You know, people have had different views on this, right? We know that. There's been different ideas on what constitutes beauty. All that's true. But it doesn't prove there's no absolute ultimate right and wrong. On the contrary, dig deeper and you discover that while societies have placed more or less value on human life, no society has said, no society has said that it's good to take the life of another person anytime you want. There are always rules. They may differ, but no society says, yes, kill all you want. No, they put certain limits on it. Yes, different societies have said you can have two wives or four wives or 12 wives. No society has ever said a man can take any woman he wants at any time and do anything he wants with her. No, no society allows that. 
during the Middle Ages, beauty was conveyed by the sense of being plump and pale. Yeah. Plump and pale. Because it meant you had money. That was attractive. So it, you, you guys have seen, like, Renaissance art, right? All the beautiful women are chunky. Very pale skin. Why? Because the idea is they have plenty of food, and that meant you had a lot of money, and they're pale. Why are they pale? Because they're indoors. They don't have to be out in the field working. You see, so, oh, yeah, let's, oh, she's a babe, right? Today, what, what, is the, what is the popular idea of beauty today? Toned and tanned. Why? Toned means, you know, you, you, you can go to the gym. You have money, go to the gym. You have some discipline. Because we have so much food now. Good grief. You can get eight McRibs and eat them all at one time. <laughs> Two breakfast sandwiches for four bucks? Are you kidding? I'm there. Right now, they got that guacamole burger at Carl's Jr. You've seen it. It's like $299 for guacamole. Oh, we forgot the decimal point. It's only $299. I'm like, $299? Three bucks for a guacamole burger? Ha! Huh, I'm buying a dozen. I don't need a dozen, but that's a good deal. Point is, we have so much food today, right? So now, the idea is, well, because we have such a, an abundance of food, and you don't have to be rich. No, rather, we, we like toned. Oh, and tanned, not pale. Because if you're pale... You're not out in the fields. You're stuck in some office with fluorescent lights. So it gives the, you have leisure time now. You can be outside and you can get a tan. So ideas of beauty have changed. You know, it's plump and pale. Now it's toned and tan. Hold on. No society says certain things are beautiful. Every society looks at some deformed body or some mutilated body and goes, oh, no, that's not right. No, that's wrong. We have these, we, we, maybe our ideas of what constitutes beauty may change, but there are some things that we universally recognize that, oh, oh it shouldn't be that way. That's ugly. We all agree on that. No culture honors cowardice. No culture honors disloyalty, deceit, theft, or brutality. None. Verse 2, But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. God's judgment isn't like our judgment, bent as it is towards self-justification. His judgment is perfect, unaffected by favoritism. It's based in truth. He has perfect understanding of what is right. He possesses perfect knowledge of all the circumstances, even our motivations. He knows the minute details of the entire thought processes that go into every decision. You know, because of the advances in DNA research, dozens of past court decisions have been reversed as old evidence is brought out and subjected to the DNA, you know, testing. And, oh, turns out the person we convicted is innocent. And they're released. With God, we never need to be concerned that one day new evidence is going to come to light that's going to reverse some previous decision that he's made. He knows the end from the beginning. Verse 3. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or you do, do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering? not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. In light of God's perfect judgment, Paul asks a couple of very important questions. Number one, do we really think we're going to wiggle our way out of judgment? And number two, do we think the delay of judgment means that God approves of our sin? Paul's point is that people are without excuse for sin. That we judge others proves we all possess an innate sense of right and wrong that even we don't live up to. But while we're so good at applying judgment to others, we somehow think that we're exempt. What adds to our moral confusion is to mistake God's merciful delay in judgment as his approval. 
God typically doesn't thump us the instant we sin. Hallelujah. He waits and sends His Spirit to convict us towards repentance. When we do repent, God forgives. Because as God's judgment is perfect, so is His love and His mercy. And that would seem to put God in a dilemma. How can He remain perfectly just with the need to punish sin while at the same time holding out mercy for those that deserve wrath? Well, that's what the cross is all about. No one gets off free. Please hear me. No one gets off free. Someone has to pay for sin. Justice demands it. On the cross, Jesus took on himself all the righteous judgment of God for our sin. What Jesus did on Calvary accrues to us when we admit our guilt and believe that when Jesus died, he paid for our sin sin. God's delay in pouring judgment on us is so that we can have time to repent and escape that judgment. Look at it this way. Our sin must be punished. Justice demands it. Either we will suffer that punishment in the future day of judgment, or Jesus has already suffered fully at the cross for it. It's one or the other. And while God has made it possible to avoid future judgment by providing the past judgment of the cross, you and I decide which day of judgment will count for us. You and I decide that. God's going to judge your sin and my sin. Either we are going to be judged for our sin in the final judgment, or God has already judged our sin in the cross of Jesus Christ. You pick the day. You pick the day. I would submit to you that it's wise to pick the cross. Please don't mistake God's delay of judgment as approval for sin. If you do, the next verses are for you. Verse 5. But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, your unrepentant heart. You are treasuring up for yourself wrath and the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God. You see, if you don't use the delay of judgment to repent, but remain hard and unrepentant, all you're doing is just adding more hurt to the seething cauldron of wrath that will eventually be poured on you. Now, Paul quotes from Psalm 62, verse 6, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory, honor, and peace to everyone, for there is no partiality with God. Remember Paul's theme in this section. Like a jeweler showing a diamond. When a jeweler wants to show a diamond, what they do is they typically take out a piece of black velvet and they'll put the jewelry on the velvet. You know, oh, because that black background shows the beauty of this gold or silver diamond. Oh, look at that. So, So Paul wants to show the glory, the beauty of the gospel. He starts out by putting the black velvet of man's wretched sinfulness there. His point is that man is without excuse. There is no hope apart from Christ. Because God's judgment is perfect, he'll render to each according to their deeds. If they've done good, they'll be rewarded. Evil, they'll be punished. But the larger point, please hear this, the larger point is that no one does good. Hey, God's going to bless those that do good. And he's going to judge those that do evil. Here's the bad news. No one does good. Sin is so insidious, it's infected every aspect of who and what we are. While we may be good in comparison to others, we're not in relation to what's required of us by God. Even the best among us aren't without failure, error, and sin. How much sin does it take to ruin us? Any sin. 
The illustration I like to use, and sometimes I'll actually do it, imagine a pane of glass. How small a crack does it take to, to make it not fit? Just the tiniest little chip, and it's now permanently flawed. Can you fix it? No. You can't fix it. It's ruined. That's you. That's me. Now, if you think that you can come to God on the basis of your works, you're headed for a world of hurt. That's what he's saying here. We can't come by works. We must come by faith. And all of this applies equally to both Jews and Gentiles. Now, Jews thought because God had given them the law, they had a leg up on everybody else. But Paul warns them, being religious, knowledgeable about God, isn't enough. They're no better than those who hadn't received the law because it's not about works. And as we end, here's how this applies to us. Do you consider yourself a good person? Are you a good person? Good answer. Some of you are like, I'm not going to say anything out loud. Cause... See, See here, here's what we do. Are you a good person? And if you know, we were to do this personally, are you a good person? So, well, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Compared, what, what is, what's your standard? What do you? Well, you know, compared to that guy in El Paso and Dayton, I'm, 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 I'm pretty awesome. Okay. Well. How about Billy Graham? How you doing? How about Mother Teresa? I don't, know. I don't compare me to those guys. <laughs> when you... When you appear before God, there's not a table. Here's God sitting here. And there's this bag of your sin over here and a bag of your good works over here. And there's a set of scales. They're evenly balanced. You walk up. Name? Um, Lance Ralston. Lance, okay, let's see. Okay, I got your bag, of, your bag of sin here. Oh, my goodness. It's a dump. It's a, it's a, it's a truck. Let's see, let's see. Pour that into this side here. And your good works. Oh, look, it's a, it's a little box they put rings in. Let's see. Put that over here. See, that's the way a lot of people think. They're going to get to heaven, and, and their good and their bad is going to be weighed out. And, and they're, oh, certainly. Because, again... We, we, we judge others on their behavior, but we want to be judged on our intentions. Certainly people think, well, certainly my good will outweigh my bad. Listen, when you get to heaven, there's no scales. It's not the way it goes down. You're asked a question. Who do you trust? And in the end, the answer is going to be either I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm tra- myself or I don't, I don't trust myself because I'm a wretch. I, I trust Jesus. And if your answer is I trust Jesus, heaven is yours. But if your answer is, well, I, I, I'm not that bad of a person, you, you don't get it. You just don't get it. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God, every single one of us. And the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Listen, let let me just try to reason with you. If you're here tonight, maybe you're a guest and you've been brought. It it was like, you know, oh, tacos. Okay, great, I'll go. (laughs) Then I guess I can sit and listen to some boring bald guy drone on for an hour. Jesus Christ of Nazareth is is a historical fact. The cross and his resurrection, by any measure of determining historical events, if if you're going to use the same rules the historians use for determining anything that has happened in history, 
you must conclude that Jesus Christ was a real historical figure, that he really died on a Roman cross, and that he really rose from the dead. Yes, I know it's a miracle. It doesn't matter. The rules of history require you believe that. If you're going to be at all consistent, If there was a way for us to get into heaven that didn't require Jesus going to the cross, then why did the Father send the Son in the first place? Don't you understand that Jesus died on that cross is proof there's no other way. Otherwise, God would have said, listen, you can work it out on your own. I'm not sending my Son to go through all of that. That he went to the cross is proof there's no other way. Believe in him tonight. You may be a wonderful person compared to most other people, but you don't measure up to the standard that's required, which is God's righteousness. You can't be right with God through your own works, but God will give you his righteousness if you'll just believe in Jesus. And if, you, and if you truly believe in him, your life will be transformed. It isn't just about getting you into heaven one day. The Holy Spirit will come and get heaven into you right now. And all of the satisfaction, all of the peace, all of the meaning that you have been looking for in life, and you've been looking for in relationships and, and, and in your career and in you know, the pursuit of knowledge, all the, all the satisfaction you've been looking for in life that's eluded you. You have a little taste of along the way. But in the end, it always, it doesn't satisfy. It doesn't satisfy that deep longing in you. That's because you were made for a relationship with God and your soul will be restless until you find your purpose in him. So we, tonight, put your faith in Jesus Christ.